morning. I'm Kim McClary, President and CEO of the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. Thank you all for joining us and thank you all so sincerely for your ongoing support. We couldn't be doing these programs without your donations and your membership renewals. So thank you, thank you so very much. Dan has three terrific topics for us today for today's edition of Politics in the Time of Coronavirus. His first topic is the Trump-Biden update, is the race getting closer? Second, the battle of the Senate majority. And third, the Trump-Biden debate preview. You all know the drill with the questions. We'll be taking them in about 20 or 25 minutes. Please type them into the control panel on the right-hand side of the screen. And Jessica will be managing them during the Q&A process. Dan, we can't wait for today's programs. It's just getting more and more, more, and more edge of your seat. Well, it's, it, it's certainly getting uh, very late in the game, uh, Kim, no question about that. Uh, for those of you who keep track of such things, and I don't imagine it's, it's many of you, there are now 273 hours until the polls close on election night, at least on the West Coast in California. So really only 11 days uh, between now and election day. Um, so it is getting very late and the timing is getting very close. The question is not, of course, whether the timing is getting close. We all know that. The question is whether the presidential race is getting closer. And I wanna spend the first few minutes of today's conversation laying out some thoughts for you on that. And then as many of you have asked about over the last weeks, we'll do an overview of the key Senate races around the country. And then finally do a preview of tonight's presidential debate between, between Biden and Trump. So before we go any further on this seminal question about whether the race is getting closer or not, before I weigh in with my thoughts, we wanna hear yours. And so Jessica, if you can post the first question, let's hear what our audience is, is thinking. So how would you assess the state of the presidential campaign at this point is our first question. Number one, uh, Biden is maintaining his lead and is likely to win. So you think, what do you mean it's getting closer, Dan? I don't see it. Number two, Trump is closing the gap, but, but Biden is still favored to win. So it is getting closer, but maybe not close enough for the president and his supporters. Third, the race is too close to call. Uh, it's a toss up at this point, uh, presumably because it has been getting, uh, the, the, the polls have been closing. Or fourth, uh, the contrarian opinion, at least out of these four, that because the president's base is so highly motivated, uh, he could get reelected. So not just as clo Trump closing the gap and Biden still favored, uh, but perhaps Trump could just pull this out after all. Now these four options I realize are not completely uh, uh, exclusive from each other. So there's a little bit of fudging here, but Jessica, if the results are in, let's see what our, let's see what our group has to say. Okay, look at this. 75% of our respondents uh, believe either that Biden is likely to win or is still favored. 41% um, reject the premise of our first topic, that Biden, that Trump is not closing the gap, that Biden rather is maintaining his lead. 34%, a pretty strong plurality, a little bit more than one third, believe that Trump is getting closer, that Biden is still favored and I presume therefore should still win. A smaller percentages, 12% say too close to call. Uh, those are people who presumably think back to the 2016 campaign and are a little bit more reticent, just like I am, to predict any final outcomes. And 13% point to the president's motivated base and see that there is still a, a a significant path from the re-election. So as always, very interesting input from you guys, but let's dig a little bit deeper now that we've offered uh, our broader thinking on this question. So first of all, in fact, the race is getting slightly closer. And what I would tell is for the Democrats in our group today, that's not a reason for panic. And for the Republicans in our group, I would say that's not necessarily a reason for major excitement because most presidential campaigns, not all of them, do tend to get a little bit closer to election day. And particularly for Democratic presidential candidates, it's worth remembering that although both Ronald Reagan and, Re and Richard Nixon won their respective reelection campaigns by very large landslides in 1984 and 1972 respectively, um, you have to go back to 1964. You have to go back more than 50 years to Lyndon Johnson's campaign against Barry Goldwater to find a Democrat who was elected president 
by more than a nine point mar by more than a nine point margin. Bill Clinton in 1992 was reelected by nine points, um, but the polls showing by then 12, 14, 16 point, points ahead, that might be the case. We don't know. But if so, it would be historically astonishing to have to go all the way back uh, to the early 1960s to find the last campaign that a Democrat won by that margin. Um, national polls uh, show Biden with a lead right around that, between 9 and 11 points. That's what they showed a month ago. So for those of you who rejected the premise of closure, you're right in that very specific regard. Uh, what we've seen since then, over the last month, is that immediately after the first debate, Biden's poll numbers jumped, his margin increased very sharply immediately after that first debate with Trump and Biden and, and Chris Wallace. And then since then, what we've seen him some settling back to where the numbers were before that debate. So the immediate response to it was for people to shift to Biden, but since then there's been some settling. And that nine to 11 point margin, you know, give or take a few points, but a high, single digit margin or a low double digit margin is pretty consistent. Not what we've just seen for the last month, but truthfully for most of the last year, even pre-pandemic, the polls have been remarkably stable and unusually stable. My own opinion is it's primarily because Donald Trump evokes such strong feelings among both of his, both his supporters and his opponents. That there's not really much room for moving the way there is in more normal campaigns. Anyway, so those are the national polls. And I know that everybody who participates in these programs each week or participates in, in them frequently knows that the national polls aren't nearly as important as the state polls. So what are we seeing at the state level? Well, at this point, uh, 11 days out, uh, Biden is leading in almost every swing state. The one key swing state in which uh, he does not have a clear lead is the state of Florida, which really does look too close to call. And Biden is leading and has uh, even in some states that ought to belong to Trump and has pulled even, at least according to some polls, in states like Texas and Georgia and Iowa, which really should belong to Trump. Um, although uh, obviously those are very closely fought as well. But, and this is something we've talked about all year long since we started these webinars back in March, Trump's voters, according to these polls, are still more motivated and still more excited than Biden's supporters. So while in these key swing states, Biden does maintain a lead, we are still seeing a larger level of enthusiasm from Trump supporters. And so we'll see you know, in 11, 12 days, we'll see if that enthusiasm manifests itself into significantly larger uh, voting levels. Let's dig in a little bit more specifically. So the key swing states, as we all know by now, because we've been watching them for almost the last four years, for the last three years, 11 months, and two weeks now, are those upper Midwestern states that had been voting Democrat for many years that elected Donald Trump president in 2016. So here's what we're seeing. In the state of Pennsylvania, the polls there show a range, a margin as much as 10 point advantage for Joe Biden, and as little as a four point advantage. Four points, of course, is within the margin of error. So at the very best for Trump, very worst for Biden, the race could be tied. But generally speaking, we look at the polls as a range. If they were all showing three or four points, we'd say, wow, that is too close. A that is a very, very close race. Um, but because they range from four to 10, that still does look like a Biden advantage, but certainly not a safe one yet. In my home state of Wisconsin, the polls are very, very similar to Pennsylvania. Uh, the largest margin for Biden is, rough, is roughly 10 points. The smallest is five points. So once again, the smallest margin within the margin of error, the largest margin showing a more considerable Biden advantage. And the state of Michigan seems to be shifting a little bit more decisively toward Biden. And a lot of people believe that's because to a large degree, uh, that's a result of the president's ongoing feud with the still very popular uh, Democratic governor of Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer. Um, but the numbers aren't that different there. Uh, the largest margin in Michigan for Biden is 12 points rather than 10. And it comes to as close as six, which is six points, which is slightly outside the margin of error. Um, so as you can tell, certainly a Biden advantage, not just at the national level, but at the state level. But those state numbers are, if you're a Biden supporter, 
a little bit too close to our comfort. And if you're a, a loyalist, loyalist to the presidents, I think you still see more, more hope in those states, given the low end of those ranges, than you do at the national level. Here's the question, why do we see so much variation? Why can't we know how far ahead Trump, uh, Biden is in a particular state as opposed to saying maybe four points, maybe 10 points, maybe six points, maybe 12 points? Well, a few reasons we see such a range. Number one, that's not that much of a difference. Most statewide polls have a margin of error of four or five points. So most of these polls aren't really that far off from each other. Um, second, it's worth remembering um, that poll, and we've talked about this before, is these polls estimate which voter groups are going, which voters are going to turn out on election day. If they poll 1,000 people and 500 say Trump and 500 say Biden, they don't just say it's a 50-50 poll. What they do is examine each voter and try to ascertain how likely he or she is to vote. And they come to that conclusion based on the respondent's past voting behavior, how regularly they voted in the past, their self-described level of enthusiasm, how excited are they, how motivated are they about this campaign, and third, demographics, because different demographic groups by age, by income, by education level, by race and ethnicity, different voter groups turn out in different numbers. And it's worth remembering not only, of course, that in 2016, pollsters missed an unusually high turnout among white working class voters based on past voting behavior. Um, that particular cohort turned out in much larger numbers for Trump than they had for Mitt Romney or John McCain or for George W. Bush. And that surprised the pollsters and all of us as well. But as we've talked about before, go back to the previous campaign, 2012, where the similar estimates were made and similar estimates uh, missed in a similar way. Because just as Donald Trump in 2016 turned out white working class voters in much larger numbers uh, than Republicans had previously, in 2012, Barack Obama turned out young people and voters from minority communities in much larger numbers than ever before. So as we talked about on Tuesday's program with Ron Brownstein, the difference here is, is not one of a margin. It's just the difference in the way we think about things. In other words, in 2012, what was expected was a narrow Barack Obama victory. It ended up being a larger one. In 2016, what was expected was a narrow Hillary Clinton victory. And it ended up being a narrow Donald Trump one. 2016 wasn't any more off course than 2012 was, but of course we remember those differences much greater when they affect the overall outcome. So here's the overall, here's the bottom line, um, uh, heading into the last 11 days of this campaign. No question that not only does Joe Biden enjoy a lead in the polls, both in key states and nationally, but he is in a better position than Hillary Clinton was four years ago. And even in those states where his poll numbers are similar to Clinton's, it's worth noting two things. Number one, Biden has higher approval ratings than Clinton did four years ago, which means there's less room for Trump to go. Back in 2016, there were a lot of what were called double haters, people who hated Clinton and Trump, or didn't like Clinton and Trump. And in the closing days of the campaign, they shifted toward Trump and polls in these states missed a lot of those voters. Biden's a lot better liked. I mean, he's not tremendously popular, but he's a lot better liked and thought of more favorably than Clinton does. And that offers him some protection unless something dramatic happens to change the voters' perception, which we now in November 3rd. The second thing, going back to a point I made earlier, is Biden's lead is much more stable than in 2016. Over the course of the summer and fall of four years ago, we saw the polls up and down and all over the place. This year, as I said at the outset, they've been much more consistent. Doesn't mean that they can't change, but it means that they're less likely to given the stability we've seen over such a longer period of time. So with that, as we wrap up this uh, first discussion, let's, uh, let's go to another question for you guys. Jessica, can you post question number two? All right, so we're gonna switch course a little bit and we'll revisit this next week. This isn't a what question, it's a when question. The question for all of you is, when do you think the presidential election will be decided? When either Donald Trump will officially be reelected or when Joe Biden uh, will have been elected as our next president? Will it be on election night, November 3rd? 
will it be an election week by the following Monday, November 9th? Will we have election month? And will we know the final results by 30 days after the election on December 3rd? Will we know by New Year's Day on January 1st? Or will we not know until Inauguration Day on Wednesday, January 20th? Let's, uh, let's see what everybody thinks, Jessica. Oh, look at that, election week. 52% of the people believe that we'll have results, of our people believe that we'll have results within a week of the election. And 83%, an overwhelming number, understand that it's unlikely that we'll have uh, results on election night or believe that we'll, unlikely that we'll have results on election night, but that it will be resolved in a somewhat timely order. 11%, and I'm guessing you know that it could go longer, believe we'll get results that night, particularly if states like Florida and North Carolina were to come in for Biden, or if Trump were to carry states that he's not expected to in the Eastern time zone. 7% of you are more pessimistic. 4% by New, say by New Year's Day, 3% say we won't get this resolved until it's time to inaugurate uh, the next president. So let's go on. Um, let's talk about the U.S. Senate, because again, that's something that all of you wanted, not all of you, but many of you have let us know through our weekly, uh, um, our weekly surveys. And yes, Jessica and Claire and I read those surveys very carefully, and we know that you've wanted to talk about the Senate for some time. So here are the basics. There are 35 seats up this year, 35 out of the 100 Senate seats are up, and there are 33 senators whose terms have naturally concluded along with two special elections, one in the state of Georgia after the retirement, uh, after the retirement of, of Senator Coverdell, and a special election in Arizona um, uh, after the death of Senator McCain. In those states, Senator Kelly Loeffler uh, was appointed, uh, Martha McSally was appointed in Arizona, but the rules of both states is they need to face the uh, voters not on that natural six-year cycle, but the next general election in their state. So that's why we have 35. Of those 35, 23 are Republican seats held by Republican senators, 12 are held by Democrats. Um, and the reason for that is because if you were to look back at 2014, when most of these senators were elected, that was Barack Obama's second midterm election. And presidents generally don't tend to do pretty well in mid don't tend to do that well in midterm elections in their second term. Democrats lost a lot of seats that year. It's what gave Republicans an advantage in this particular class. So of those, um, the analysts who I respect the most say that there are 14 competitive U.S. Senate seats this year. Um, and the 14 seats, and don't worry, we're not going to go through all of them individually, but real quick, there are 14 competitive Senate seats in the states of Alabama, Alaska, Arizona, Colorado, Georgia, two in Georgia actually, Iowa, Kansas, Maine, Michigan, Montana, North and South Carolina, and Texas. And for anybody who's wondering, yes, I did make notes on that. I have not memorized the 14 states in which there are competitive Senate races. What's interesting about those 14 is that 12 of them, all except for Alabama and Michigan, are held by Republicans. So Republicans are on defense here. Now, of those 14, at least according to polls at this point, four look very likely to switch. The others are either too close to call or leaning slightly toward the incumbent. But in four of the races, it appears that the challenger has a very significant advantage in the closing days uh, of the campaign. One of those states is Arizona, where the appointed incumbent Martha McSally is running behind her challenger, Mark Kelly. In Colorado, where the Republican incumbent, Cory Gardner, is running considerably behind his challenger, the former governor, John Hickenlooper. In the state of Maine, longtime incumbent Susan Collins is running behind her challenger, the assembly speaker there, uh, Sarah Gideon. And in the state of Alabama, the one Democratic seat on this list, you may remember that Democrat Doug Jones was elected in Alabama under what I'll just say diplomatically were very unusual circumstances uh, when he first ran. So if those four seats switch, three to the Democrat and one to the Republican, then the makeup of the Senate becomes 51 to 49. So let's say, just for the sake of argument, and this isn't a prediction, but based on the polls we were talking about earlier, let's say Joe Biden wins the presidency. That means Democrats need one seat 
out of those nine Republican senators in order to achieve a 50 to 50 tie in the Senate. And of course, if Biden is elected, then Senator, then Vice President Kamala Harris would break the tie. So nine Republican seats, Democrats just need one of them. Quick aside, the one of those competitive seats held by a Democrat, held by Senator uh, Gary Peters of Michigan, the Republican challenger John J is John, a man by the name of John James, and if he wins, then the Democrats need two seats. But again, based on current public opinion polling, Democrats need one out of nine in all the states I referenced in order to win back the majority in the Senate. So Jessica, let's go to our next question and see what our, what our group thinks about the likely outcome here. Which do you believe will be the partisan makeup of the U.S. Senate in January? Will there be a Republican majority? Will there be a Democratic majority? Would the Democrats able to win one of those nine seats and the others go the way predicted? Will it be a 50 to 50 tie with the Republican vice president, which means that Donald Trump is reelected and Mike Pence would break the ties in the Senate? Or will it be a 50 50 tie with a Democratic vice president, as I said earlier, with Kamala Harris casting the deciding vote on contend contentious issues? Uh, what do we see, Jessica? What comes up? I'll look at that. Um, 68%, a little bit over two thirds, say a clear Democratic majority. If you include 50 50, which is a practical equivalent of a majority, that means that 92% of our respondents believe that Chuck Schumer will be the Democratic, well, excuse me, will be the Senate majority leader come January. 8% believe McConnell will continue in that role, either by holding the majority or by 3% uh, who believe Trump will be reelected re -elected, and that Pence will break the tie. So 92% think that Chuck Schumer is going to be majority leader again in the very near future. Very interesting. Um, so a couple of things I'm going to uh, offer you, and we'll talk more about this next week as it get close, it gets closer to the election. Um, but something to keep in mind, well, actually, I'll tell you what, let's come back and we'll talk more about the Senate a little bit next week when it is closer to the election. And what we can do is talk about the races that are most important to watch on election night. So Jessica, if we can just make a note to come back and do that for the group next week. Because what I wanna do instead, because I really wanna to get to your questions, is we wanna talk about tonight's debate just a little bit before we open it up. All right, so tonight was supposed to be the third presidential debate, um, but it will be the second, at least probably, because I don't know about all of you, but I won't believe until Donald Trump and Joe Biden actually walk onto the stage that it's happening. I think it's likely that it does, but in this political climate, you never know. So we'll still call it a likely second debate. Last week, as I think all of you saw, instead of a debate, we ended up with dueling town halls on two separate networks at the same time. And nothing really unexpected happened. Trump was combative. Biden was relatively unmemorable. And nothing happened in either to change the overall dynamic of the campaign. Tonight, I'm going to offer you three things to watch for. Number one, after the first debate, there was a considerable amount of discussion about whether the moderator should be equipped with a mute button in order to keep the candidates from interrupting each other. And the Presidential Commission on Debates came up with what seems to be a compromise, that rather than giving the moderator the ability to mute either Joe Biden or Donald Trump whenever they interrupt their opponent, what they're going to do instead is at the beginning of each of the six different segments of the debate, six different policy areas, at the beginning of each of those six different segments, both candidates are going to be given a two-minute opening, and their opponent will be muted during that opening. After that, it's every man for himself. Second, um, I would encourage you to keep an eye on two particular issues that are likely to come up. Um, for Joe Biden, watch for questions from the moderator Kristen Welker on the Supreme Court. Biden's been under a lot of pressure to talk about whether he supports expanding the court, just this morning, um, it, was, uh, it was announced that Biden will call for a bipartisan commission to study Supreme Court reform, not just increasing the size of the court, but potentially term limits for justices and other possible reforms. That's probably not going to get him off the hook. But when the, the moderator does ask him about the Supreme Court, at least he'll have something to say. We'll see how he handles it. And Donald Trump, uh, based on the news that broke last night, uh, in which 
uh, leaders of U.S. intelligence agencies and the FBI uh, announced that Iran and Russia have obtained voter registration information and are sending disinformation to Americans ahead of Election Day. Look for questions about Russia to come at Trump with renewed intensity, and we'll see what he, what he says on them. And then finally, what I think will be the most interesting and perhaps most important part of the, well, most interesting part of the debate, everyone can judge whether it's important or not. Here's what we know. We know that Donald Trump is going to attack Hunter Biden, uh, Vice President Biden's son, for his financial dealings and business involvement over the years. It's something that the campaign, that Trump has done in speeches. It's something the campaign has done in ads. It's a virtual certainty uh, that Trump is going to come at Biden hard on that tonight. That's not, that's easy to predict. To me, what will be the most interesting thing to watch in tonight's debate is how Joe Biden re responds to those very harsh attacks on his son. Um, as we saw in the 2016 debates, we've learned that when candidates engage Trump in, in kind, and are just as combative and just as belligerent as he is, that generally works to Trump's advantage. So I don't expect Biden to respond as aggressively as Trump will attempt to goad him into doing. On the other hand, though, we're talking about this man's son. And if he doesn't stand up for his own family and shows some strength, that that's something that could do some, Biden some political harm. So the question for me is how will Biden respond? Is there a way for him to show strength without belligerence? My guess is that's what they've been practicing. That's what they've been practicing all week. So those are my thoughts on three topics. And I am, like I said earlier, um, eager to move on to my favorite part of our weekly webinar. I'm going to be joined, lucky me, for the next uh, 35 minutes or so by Claire Krellitz. Uh, she and Jessica switched roles today just to catch, keep me off guard. So Claire, what have we got? Have we got a question, maybe two, maybe three? You know, just a few as always, um, but that was a perfect segue where you just ended because a lot of people are asking about Hunter Biden and the story. So we'll start with uh, your take on how big is the Hunter Biden story and will the Hunter Biden situation hurt Biden? Okay, so as, as, as most of you know by now, um, uh, when Joe Biden was vice president, his son, his son Hunter Biden had some extensive business dealings in the country of Ukraine. And this, of course, is what led to the Trump impeachment uh, uh, last year. Um, last week, the New York Post, so Ruda, uh, Ruda, uh, Rupert Murdoch-owned newspaper, uh, printed uh, a story that made some very, very harsh allegations against Hunter Biden suggesting that he'd arranged a meeting for a Ukrainian businessman with his father, the then vice president. Um, those allegations, while printed in the Post, have not been verified by most of the mainstream news media organizations. The Washington Post, the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, and the broadcast network and cable networks have not been able to yet uh, to verify that story. Um, that said, it's something, as I said earlier, that Trump and his campaign and his allies are, uh, are criticizing Joe Biden on very, very harshly. And is it serious? Well, if the allegations were true, um, they would be serious. If, uh, if the vice president's son was using his access to his father um, to arrange business meetings, it's certainly not unheard of. And Biden loyalists would point out with some justification that this is something that Donald Trump's children do on a fairly regular basis. So I'm not suggesting it's unique. I'm not suggesting it's catastrophic. But if it were proven to be true, it would be of some import. But it's unlikely that by this evening, when the candidates take the stage, that mainstream news organizations will have verified the charges. Um, they'll still come up. Um, but to me, it's less a matter of how serious the charges are, because we don't know yet, and more a matter of how one of the two men who's going to become our next president handles such a challenging situation um, when he's being forcefully accosted on something relating to one of his own children. Yeah, thank you. So I know you talked a little bit already about how Joe Biden 
can maybe handle it on the debate stage, but somebody's wondering how should Joe Biden handle the Hunter Biden issue at large for the rest of the campaign? Well, at this point, Joe Biden is a little bit like um, a football quarterback who has uh, a two touchdown lead in the last minutes of the game. When you're ahead, you don't throw a lot of passes, you don't take a lot of risks. You run the ball and you just don't, what you, you don't want is an interception or a fumble or anything that's gonna change the overall dynamic of the game. So my guess is, is that Biden is going to play it as safe as possible. And that even tonight and for the next uh, 11 days after tonight, he will answer any question that comes up about his son in precisely the way he has answered it every day for the past several months. Um, voters decide for themselves whether that's an adequate response or not. But unless Trump can pressure him into a forced error tonight, don't expect to hear anything different from Joe Biden on this topic over the course of the campaign. Once again, to me, what's interesting about tonight is not what Biden says, but how he says it. And as we know, for a lot of voters, they take the measure of a man or a woman, particularly for an executive office. And although policy matters ultimately decide most people's votes, we do want a sense of confidence in the individual too. So this will be a test for Biden tonight. And like I said, I think it'll be very interesting to see how he, how he conducts himself when being, uh, when being pressured on it. We've got a lot of questions on polls as always. So oh. the first, in all my years, I've never been polled. How do pollsters select the interviewees in each demographic group? Okay, so first of all, the fact that, an, that, that one of us hasn't been polled shouldn't cause any suspicion. Um, most national polls uh, survey somewhere between 500 and 1,000 people. There are a few very large, very far-reaching online polls and a, a few very ambitious phone polls that poll several thousand people, but that's several thousand people in a country of several hundred million. And so the odds of any of us be getting a call or an email asking us to survey is, is, is pretty slim. How is it done? There's two ways uh, that a respondent pool is put together for a public opinion poll. Um, one is to look at the voter file, the lists of voters for every state, every county, every city, every precinct that exist uh, usually in a state secretary of state's office and or a county registrar's office. Um, and individuals are pulled from that list of registered voters um, to approximate of uh, the uh, demographic and partisan composition of the electorate. So in other words, if my poll surveys 500 people and the first 490 turn out to be Republicans, I'm going to go back in until I find uh, people with some type of not only partisan balance to reflect that of the community I'm polling in, but also a demographic. Balance. Um, I want to see a slightly larger number of women than men and want to see a racial and ethnic and income and education level uh, diversity that reflects that of the, of the overall electorate. The other way it can be done um, is simply randomly. Um, and either randomly by phone or, or randomly online, making calls or sending emails to anyone. And on phone, it's, 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 it's done by computer. It's called random digit dial. They just plug in 10 numbers. Um, and then from those, call people who say that they are either registered to vote or likely to vote and survey them. Um, every polling concern, Every polling company, whether it's a media organization or any other, has a different way of compiling its sample. But the most credible ones, the ones we see in the news on a regular basis, I think do not a perfect job, as we talked about earlier, given the ined inevitable margins of error, but do a fairly good job of approximating the partisan and demographic uh, makeup of the electorate. Thank you. This election is different because huge numbers of people have already voted. How does this affect predictions? Well, it, it makes predictions easier. Um, as of last night, roughly 42 million Americans had already voted. And this goes back to the conversation we're having about the debate earlier. This debate is Donald Trump's last opportunity 
to change the overall conversation about the campaign. That's not to say that he can't win votes and continue to make up ground between now and November 3rd. But this is the last high profile opportunity to fundamentally change the way people think about the campaign. And for those 42 million people who've already voted, while they theoretically can change the way they think about the campaign, they can't go back and change their vote. So what it means is that a very large percentage, an unusually large percentage of votes are locked in just under two weeks out. And so anything the candidates do or say or any ads they run or scandals that come up can't impact votes that are already cast. Uh, so while that's uh, it, it's still a, a somewhat courageous slash foolhardy business to predict outcomes, it is worth noting um, that as votes, well, I'll, I'll say this another way, um, primarily because of the president's uh, comments and warnings about the dangers of mail voting, we're seeing a huge partisan skew in mail voting and other early voting around the country. In many states, including California, for many years, Republicans were much more proficient at encouraging their supporters to vote, to vote by mail. But this year, given the president's warnings, we're seeing by a very, very large margin that early voters are Biden supporters. And so that doesn't necessarily mean that Biden is going to win by a large margin because the same polls show that the overwhelming majority of voters on election day are going to cast ballots for Donald Trump. So what we're seeing now is we're seeing Biden's advantage growing and growing every day in the key states around the country. The question is, is whether Trump can catch up on election day. That's and obviously that's something we can't predict. And we won't ask you to predict that, um, as we know. And as I think all of you know, this wonderful mug that Clara and Jessica got me, no to predictions, yes to coffee. I'm 12 days out and I've been able to honor that, that mantra. Yes. Um, so putting on your political psychology cap a little bit now, do you think candidate preferences are hardwired and thus not susceptible to change? Are candidate preferences hardwired and not susceptible to change? Um, I don't believe that. Um, you know, for, for the large majority of the electorate, uh, uh, most of us, most people line up fairly loyally behind one party and one party's candidates year after year, election after election. Um, and so I, I, I guess the answer would be yes for most voters, to the, to the question for most voters, but not for all voters. We know, and I think I've talked with all of you about this before, we know that roughly 20% of the electorate has voted for candidates of both major parties over the last number of election cycles. Some of them um, have changed their mind from one party and become a loyal voter for one party, then another loyal voter, and then a loyal voter for the other. Um, but more, but, but frequently, uh, these are voters who will vote based on an individual candidate rather than on uh, uh, um, rather than automatically voting for one party line. So the large majority of voters, because they're very loyal, I think would give some credence to the question. But as long as a significant plurality of voters will change their mind on which party's candidates they vote for from election to election, I don't know if I could make as broad an assertion as the question was as the question was asking for. Your take on whether millennials will show up at the ballot box to the same extent that they did in the street protests. Okay, your take is a very crafty way of saying your prediction. And so I'm, I've, I've almost made it all through to election day, so I'm not gonna fall for it. Um, what I will tell you though, what I will tell you though is this, um, early voting has leaned disproportionately toward older voters. The, the, the turnout of younger voters in mail voting and early voting um, is, is fairly small, but that's fairly typical. That doesn't mean that young people aren't going to vote on election day. It just means that historically, they've been much more likely to vote on election day than by mail or in other types of early voting. You know, this is the gamble, or this is a portion of the gamble that the Biden campaign has made uh, ever since he achieved the nomination. If you look at not just young people, but voters from minority communities and other progressives, the base of the Democratic Party, 
These voting cohorts, as we've talked about before, have never been all that excited about Joe Biden. The Biden campaign had a strategic choice to make. Do we prioritize our efforts on motivating those young people in voters from minority communities and other progressives, or we prioritize persuading those voters in the political center, most notably the white working class voters who Trump won in 2016. And the Biden campaign's gamble is that if he, Biden, and they, they their campaign, focus on those swing voters, that even if Donald Trump is not, excuse me, even if Joe Biden is not motivating young people and the other portions of the Democratic base, their gamble is that Donald Trump is. So if young people do turn out in great numbers um, on election day, it won't be because of what Joe Biden has been saying and doing. It'll be because of what Donald Trump has been saying and doing. And what's presumed in that answer, but I should clarify just to make sure, is Generation Z and Millennials, these two generations, skew dramatically left. They are by far the most progressive generations in the electorate. And even if Donald Trump is reelected this year, that bodes a longer term challenge for the Republican Party. Because what we know from studying these trends in the past is that while people can change their mind over the course of their, their careers and their lifetimes, what we know is that if somebody votes for one party's candidates in their first three elections after they get the right to vote, it's pretty likely that they're gonna stay in that party throughout their, throughout their career. The most conservative portion of the electorate are those voters who came of voting age during the Reagan-Bush era in the 1980s. And progressives, excuse me, and millennials and Gen Z, it looks like, will be skewing just as hard left in the years to come as that uh, 80s cohort did uh, skewing right. So a few questions about Obama. Uh, did Obama make a difference in his appearance yesterday? And then what impact do you think Obama's presence on the campaign trail will have in the last 12 days of the race? Yeah. So this is a great follow-up to the previous question. Nicely done, Claire. Because if you notice uh, not just what Barack Obama was saying yesterday, but where he was saying it, he was in South Philadelphia. Um, he was in Pennsylvania, but he was not in Erie. He was not in small town Pennsylvania. He was in very, very heavily Democratic areas. And so it appears that what the Biden campaign has decided to do, and I think it makes sense, is to deploy Barack Obama, and I expect in the next several days, Michelle Obama, to motivate the base that Biden is spending less time talking to. And so their hope is that if Biden is working to persuade those swing voters in the middle of the political spectrum, that surrogates like Barack and Michelle Obama can motivate young people and voters from minority communities and other progressives. So it's another way of saying, I don't know that Barack Obama is going to change a lot of votes, but that's not what the Biden campaign needs from him. He needs them to motivate their most loyal Democratic supporters to turn out for Biden in a way, particularly in those swing states, particularly in those large cities in Philadelphia and Cleveland and Detroit and Milwaukee, he, they need the Obamas to motivate a greater base turnout um, in this election than was the case four years ago for Clinton. Well, on the flip side of that group you're just talking about, um, this question says, many of my Republican friends who are voting for Biden are worried about an all democratic legislature and its implications for the future. Your view? Right. So I, I find myself in the, in the classroom at the schools where I teach, starting more and more sentences with the phrase, I'm old enough to remember when. And Claire, Jessica, don't worry, it'll happen to you guys too, just not for a long time. So one of the, way, one of the sentences I start with that phrase, I'm old enough to remember when ticket splitting actually happened. I'm old enough to remember when many voters made a conscious decision like the questioner's friends to sort of hedge their bets. Maybe you vote for a Republican for president, but then you vote for a Democrat for Senator and for Congress to balance out that Republican. Maybe you vote for a Democrat for governor, but you vote for Republicans for legislature in order to keep that Democrat from getting too far, uh, too far out of control. That simply doesn't happen anymore. Yeah, we talked about the Senate races earlier, and I mentioned to you that out of the 14 competitive Senate races, four looked most likely to, uh, to switch. And the reason for that 
is because although Republicans hold Senate seats in Maine and in Colorado and in Arizona, it appears that those states are very, very likely to vote for Joe Biden this year. And I talked about the one Democratic senator in Alabama. Well, the reason he's so endangered is because Donald Trump is almost certain to carry his state. 2016, uh, four years ago, was the first time since this country went to a direct election of senators in the early 20th century, it was the first time ever that every senator on the ballot in both parties who won was running in a state that was won by their party's presidential candidate. So in other words, every single senator running in a state that Hillary Clinton won in 2016, every Democratic senator won, and every Republican Senate candidate running in a state that Donald Trump carried four years ago won as well. There might be a slight aberration to it this year, but what's becoming clear is that as our country becomes more and more polarized and more and more balkanized, the idea of voting for people of both sides to keep an eye on each other has fallen decidedly out of fashion. And the growing numbers of true believers, both on the left or the right, want their party in total and complete control no matter what. So the art of ticket splitting, I think, has become a lost art in American politics and will remain one until we find a way to knit our electorate back together. How do you think Trump will respond to any debate questions about the New York Times recent revelations about his secret Chinese bank accounts? Well, in a, on a debate stage, I think Trump will dismiss the question fairly quickly and segue fairly quickly um, to how tough he has been on China, either in trade deals or in other ways. Uh, on a more normal political landscape, this would be a really important story. And this is something that Barack Obama talked about yesterday in his, in his speech in Philadelphia. He said, can you imagine if I, Barack Obama, had had a bank account? In China, what the Republicans would have said about me, he said they would have called me Beijing Berry, which is probably what would have happened. Um, in other words, Republicans would have been just outraged that a Democratic president have a bank account in China, as Democratic voters are about a Republican president who does. But um, on the debate stage and in interviews, um, Trump will you know, move past, past the question fairly quickly. Because one of the few areas where there's not a lot of at least rhetorical difference between Biden and Trump is how badly both of them want to be seen as being tough on China. And so Trump will move from his bank account to the more aggressive stances he'll argue he's taken against China over the years fairly quickly. And I think judging uh, after tonight's debate, judging by the interviews that the president had with Leslie Stahl, uh, which will be aired on 60 Minutes this Sunday, but which the White House released in its entirety today. But if you watch that interview with Leslie Stahl, if you remember, if you saw his encounter with Savannah Guthrie in last week's NBC town hall, I don't think that over the next 11 days, we'll see Trump doing a great deal of media interviews with anyone other than fairly friendly sources. So in other words, if he's not pushed on it tonight, he probably won't be pushed on it until until election day. Also on, on the debate tonight, will Trump, or sorry, how will the revised debate rules change Trump's demeanor and ability to be out of control? Well, the, the Commission on Presidential Debates, as we talked about earlier, uh, seems to have arrived at somewhat of a compromise. If they had given the moderator a mute button for her to wield throughout the entire debate, um, I think that the president would have had real trouble with that and would have seen that trouble play out in real time on the debate stage. But this is a more limited mute button. They're not asking the candidates to respect each other's uh, time throughout the entire debate, but just for six two minute segments. And so I think it's less likely to be a problem or a challenge than it would be if it were a, a debate long phenomena. I will say this. From what I've read, the president's advisors heading into both the first debate and to the town hall um, attempted to encourage him to be less combative. And the president believes, with some historical justification, that his most loyal supporters respond to him most favorably when he is, favorably when he is that combative and that aggressive. So 
as you saw, that advice didn't really take during the first debate or during the town hall meeting. What it's been reported they're telling him now is something that's a little bit different. Instead of telling him to be less aggressive for his sake, what they're telling him is if you let Biden talk uninterrupted, he, Biden, will make mistakes. He, Biden, will say stupid things. As long as you're interrupting him, Mr. President, Biden, you're actually protecting Biden because he doesn't have an extended period of time you know, to err. And so the, the argument they're making to him is that standing down at least a little bit isn't a sign of weakness, but it would be a strategically smart decision in order to give Biden more of an opportunity to stumble. That advice sounds like it has the potential to be more successful than their previous efforts, but once again, we won't know, and we won't know until tonight. Great. Um, and so we have a few questions on voter suppression. I know this is something that you and Ron Brownstein addressed just the other day. So if you didn't see that discussion, it's on our YouTube channel. It was very informative and engaging and lots of key insights. But I will ask you now, what might be the impact of voter suppression in this election? Okay. So th this might sound like a semantic difference, but I've, I've angered people in both parties by making this point in the past. Um, Republicans spend a great deal of time talking about and warning about voter fraud. Democrats spend a lot of time talking about and warning about voter suppression. There's almost no voter fraud in this country, and Republicans exaggerate that for reasons that we'll talk about in a minute. But if you define voter suppression as forbidding someone to vote, as opposed to making it more difficult, there's not a lot of voter suppression in this country. There are all sorts of laws in, st in states around the country that create additional challenges. More than half of the states in America, for example, require uh, a photo ID in order to cast a ballot. Some require signatures from a witness on mail ballots. So I draw a distinction between making voting more challenging and absolutely forbidding it altogether. Um, and the instances of absolute voter suppression, just forbidding someone to cast a ballot who would otherwise be elig uh, eligible is just as rare as examples of voter fraud in both parties, I would say, at the risk of angering my friends on both sides of the aisle. Both sides use these fear tactics, fraud on one side, suppression on the other, in order to frighten their own most loyal supporters and motivate them to turn out on election day. All that said, um, if you allow me to reframe the question as one of voter discouragement as opposed to absolute voter suppression, um, my guess is we're going to see a mixed bag over the next couple of weeks. We're already seeing courts around the country ruling in both directions. Courts that, for example, have allowed the state of Pennsylvania to extend its deadline for mail ballots to be accepted. Yesterday, we saw a decision in the state of Alabama that prohibited uh, curbside voting. What tends to drive more, for lack of a better term, more left-leaning judges is making voter access their highest priority. Conservative judges articulate a different philosophy, not that they want to discourage voting, but rather what they talk about is displaying deference to local and state elected officials. So for example, the Alabama Secretary of State said that he did not think that state law permitted for curbside voting. And so the court deferred to him. In Pennsylvania, the legislature said that they did believe an additional number of days for a mail ballot to arrive at a polling place was adequate. And so ultimately, four members of the eight-person Supreme Court deferred to, deferred to that judgment. So partisans ascribe all sorts of motives, not just to politicians, but to judges that they perceive to be on the other side of the argument. But if you start with that premise, that a judge who tends to lean leftward makes voting access the first priority, and a judge who leans rightward tends to make um, adherence or following the judgment of local or state elected officials, their guiding principle. I think that's where you see the, the dichotomy emerge. And so what I'm certain we'll see over the next couple of weeks and beyond is very much of a mix, mixed bag. Um, Left-leaning judges looking to expand the voting pool uh, in a responsible way to the greatest degree possible and right-leaning judges, and I would argue an equally responsible way, whenever possible, deferring to the judgment of the 
elected officials who people in the re relevant states put into office. If no deal is reached between Nancy Pelosi and Steve Mnuchin before the election, will prospective voter decisions be affected? Um, probably not. And in fact, I'd frame it the other way, is that if a deal were reached between the White House and Democrats, and if the Senate Republicans were to vote to support that deal, which looks very unlikely, that would probably provide somewhat of a boost to the president. So it's not surprising that over the last couple of weeks, you've heard Trump talking more and more frequently about the importance of passing another COVID relief bill. And you have some Democrats um, who are telling Pelosi, who are telling Pelosi they don't want to for just that reason. At this point, it looks pretty problematic because even if Mnuchin and Pelosi were to come to a deal in the next hour or so, just given the way Congress works, the amount of time required to call for a vote to review the legislation and to vote on it, makes it almost impossible for that bill to be signed into law before the election. And Pelosi acknowledged that last night that given Mitch McConnell's opposition to the legislation that she and Mnuchin are negotiating, he doesn't think it would pass the Senate. So she's said somewhat fatalistically that she thinks passing a bill before election day is unlikely. It should be noted in fairness to the Republicans on the call that Senator McConnell and the Republican majority in the Senate did pass a much, much smaller relief bill last week, or excuse me, they did introduce a much smaller relief bill last week that Senate Democrats refused to hear. So as is the case on so many of these things, plenty of blame to go along, plenty of finger pointing in, in both directions. But the premise to, but the answer to the voters to the, to the question is I would say I have about as much of a chance of starting uh, game three of the World Series for the Dodgers as a COVID relief package has of being signed into law before election day. And my arm isn't nearly what it used to be. Um, we have a lot of questions about what's going to happen on election day, which we won't have time to get to today, but I will just plug that we are having Dan do an election day special with us. So check that out and register for it. There should be some really good insights coming from that. Um, I'll leave our final audience question. We're going big here. Do you think the Republic will survive current divisions? Yes. Uh Way back when we started the webinar several months ago, I recommended a book to our, our much smaller audience then than the one we have now. So I'll recommend it again. There's a wonderful book that was published in 2017 by John Meacham, the American historian. The book is called The Soul of America. And the premise of Meacham's book is that the period, is that the, the, the divisions, the animosity, the hatred, that we're seeing in society today, that we're seeing in American society today, um, is not unique, it's not new. And in fact, we face these challenges as a country ever since before we were a country. And what Meacham argues very passionately and I think credibly, and it's a wonderful, wonderful book, is he takes us back through those, periods, period, those previous periods of division, when we faced maybe not identical challenges to those that we do today, but very similar ones, and walks us through how we got through those challenges, how we overcame them. Some of them are pretty apparent. Lincoln, MLK, the Civil Rights Act, Lyndon Johnson. Others are much more surprising. And the lesson that I take away from the book is that it requires not just obvious leaders, but unlikely leaders and unlikely heroes, improbable women and men who step forward to help our society overcome these challenges. And Meacham has convinced me at least that we've done it enough times before that we can do it again. And you know, what I take away from that book is, while we haven't been here before, we've been here before. And so far, at least for hundreds of years, good people, good women and men have found a way to come together and to overcome those challenges. I think we will again. Yes, I think that's a message that many people would benefit from hearing. So thank you, Dan. Always a pleasure. And I'll turn this back over to you. Thank you, Claire. Dan, as always, thank you so very much. We're all, all going to be watching the debate tonight with all of your advice and counsel. And uh, this was so helpful to all of us. Well, thank but you. And in fairness to our audience, that our, our, our group, our participants, 
When we come back next week, we will talk about what to watch for on election night, and in particular to pick where we left off by talking about which Senate races in particular to be paying attention to as we watch the results come in. Thank you, Dan. For those of you who are enjoying Dan's excellent guidance through this um, challenging election cycle, please help us uh, to continue to provide these, these wonderful programs for you by texting the word, the name Schnur, S-C-H-N-U-R to the number on the screen. It really helps for us to keep this going. And Dan has some terrific programs coming up in addition to the election day program that Claire mentioned. He'll be here on Tuesday speaking about how the media will influence the election. We also next week have a conversation with John Hope Bryant, the founder of Operation Hope. So actually a program not related to the election. Dan, thank you so much as always. And I want everybody to stay safe, stay informed, and we'll hope to see you next Tuesday. Thank you. Thank everybody. You. Thanks everybody.